Hello, everyone. Um, my name is Makila Sims. I'm a third year here at the college, double majoring in cinema media studies and Spanish. <laughs> Thank you. Um, this quarter, I have had the absolute pleasure of taking Professor Not uh, Allison Nadia Field's class titled Creating a Different Image, Black Women Filmmaking of the 1970s to the 90s. In this class, and I do still very much consider the space that we're in right now class, um, we studied the ex and explored the rich intersections between black women filmmakers, literary production, and feminism from the 70s to the 90s. In addition to our standard classroom meetings, every Thursday evening through an open classroom initiative of the Film Study Center, we opened our doors and gathered with the greater Chicago community members to screen all of your wonderful films, um, often followed by a Q&A and an open discussion on your pieces, which were incredible. 10 years ago, Professor Field was a part of the LA Rebellion project. And as we all know, during the initial LA Rebellion, many prints and negatives had disappeared or were deteriorated. And in 2009, Field's collaboration with UCLA Film and Television Archive launched a preservation initiative, followed the next year by a traveling symposium and screening at international venues. This program included 56 films, including scores of new prints and 12 fully preserved works. Absolutely incredible. Following this restoration initiative, Field co-edited the book titled LA Rebellion, Creating a New Black Cinema, published in 2015. This book is the first book dedicated to the films and filmmakers of the LA Rebellion. She is also the author of Uplift Cinema, The Emergence of African American Film and the Possibility of Black Modernity. Uplift Cinema explores the emergence of black filmmaking practices in the period prior to D.W. Griffin's A Birth of a Nation mm, and the proliferation of race cinema that began in the late teens. Currently, as you all know, Professor Field co-organized the 2023 Sojourner Truth Festival of the Arts. This symposium, which is the culminating part of her class, has been an incredible forum for discourse, education, and appreciation. And this would not be possible without her. So please, everyone, join me in welcoming Professor Allison Nadia Field. Um, thanks, Michaela, so much. Um, I'm really going mean, to, I agree, we're still in class, but I'm going to miss uh, this quarter so much. Um, I also want to give a shout out to my co-organizers of the LA Rebellion Project, Jacqueline Stewart and Jan Christopher Horak. I know. Jackie wanted to be here, but she's, you know, running the world right now, so she can't. She's at the Academy Museum, of course. Um, but that was really the moment, I think, that set the seed, uh, for me at least, for a lot of the work going forward. And one of the goals we had back then was really to think about future iterations and what would they look like and what could kind of engage scholarship, archiving, curatorial work, public exhibition look like um, in the future. So I'm really happy to be here having come from that trajectory. Um, this is the last panel today. So I also want to thank Frank and the entire crew here at the Logan Center for the Arts um, in the performance hall. I have to say there's been so much, as you can imagine, technical juggling um, with our guests who had to join by Zoom while also managing streaming, which is apparently super impossible. Um, so I want to thank them for doing that and making it seem so effortless. I know it was not, so thank you. I also want to thank Truth and Documentary for recording and managing the live stream. Um, and I want to thank Kayla and Natasha for their photography throughout. Um, we are documenting, we are heavily documenting because we are writing history. Um, so it's my privilege uh, to moderate this panel that is so generously sponsored by Film Quarterly. Um, Film Quarterly scholars respond critical perspectives on black women's filmmaking. And I really want to thank B. Ruby Rich and Rebecca Prime for having the willingness and the vision to bring this group of scholars together um, for this conversation. We'll be thinking about scholarship, but also pedagogy and forms of public engagement that extend from our classrooms and from our writing. So I'm going to briefly introduce our panelists in alphabetical order. Um, so wave when I say your name. Okay, <laughs> Courtney R. Baker uh, is Associate Professor of English at the University of California, Riverside, and author of Humane Insight, Looking at Images of African American Suffering and Death, published in 2015 by the University of Illinois Press. 
Her research, writing, and teaching focus on black film, art, and literature. Her article, Framing Blackness, Selma and the Poetics of Representation, was nominated by the journal Camera Obscura for the Society of Cinema Media Studies Kovacs Prize for Best Essay in 2022. And she's currently working on a book manuscript on black labor and film formalism. Terry Francis. <laughs> is associate professor in the School of Communication at the University of Miami and the author of the brilliant Josephine Baker's Cinematic Prism, published by Indiana University Press in 2021. Francis is a 2022 Andy Warhol Foundation Arts Writers grantee for her forthcoming book, Make That Art, Kevin Jerome Everson's Body of Work, which we all need. Her art writing has appeared in exhibition catalogs as well as a range of art and culture publications. Her writing about black performance, film, and the conundrums of black representation has been featured in the academic journals Film History, Black Camera, Transition, Feminist Media Histories, ASAP, and Film Quarterly. From 2017 to 2021, Francis directed the Black Film Center and Archive at Indiana University. Raquel J. Gates. is a foreword from Chicago. <laughs> she is associate professor of film at Columbia University. She received her PhD from Northwestern University's Department of Screen Cultures and holds an MA in Humanities from the University of Chicago, as well as a BS in Foreign Service from Georgetown University. She is the author of Double Negative, The Black Image in Popular Culture, published by Duke University Press in 2018, where she argues that some of the most disreputable representations of black people in popular media can strategically pose questions about blackness, black culture, and American society in ways more respectable ones cannot. Her work appears in both academic as well as popular publications, some of which include Film Quarterly, television and new media, the New York Times, the Los Angeles Review of Books, The Root, as well as other journals and collections. In 2020, she was named an Academy Film Scholar by the Academy of Motion Picture Arts and Sciences, um, and she will use that grant to support her work on her current book project, Hollywood Style and the Invention of Blackness. Michael Boyce Gillespie is Associate Professor of Cinema Studies in the Department of Cinema Studies at New York University. He's the author of Film Blackness, American Cinema and the Idea of Black Film, published by Duke University Press in 2016, and co-editor of the Black One Shot um, series with Lisa Udin, um, an art criticism series on ASAP J. His work focuses on black visual and expressive culture, film theory, visual historiography, popular music, and contemporary art, and his recent writing has appeared in Regeneration, Black Cinema, 1898 to 1971 at the Academy, um, Film Quarterly, Film Comment, and Liquid Blackness. And I believe he is our only man at the whole symposium <laughs> on the stage, um, but we love him anyway. Uh, <laughs> Haley O'Malley. <laughs> deserves all the applause. She is assistant professor in the Department of Cinematic Arts at the University of Iowa, and her interdisciplinary research and teaching focus on African-American film, literature, and visual culture. Her current book project, Dreams of a Black Cinema, is an archivally driven history of the myriad ways that African-American women writers experimented with film and worked to build new black women's film culture from the 1960s to the 1990s. If you didn't know it, this is all like research for her book. <laughs> So thank you for participating in that. Um, her writing has been published or is forthcoming in Black Camera, James Baldwin Review, ASAP J, Feminist Media Histories, Shakespeare on Stage and Off, The Cambridge Companion to Contemporary African American Literature, The Oxford Handbook of American Film History, and other venues. Miriam J. Petty, in the middle, is Associate Professor of Screen Cultures at Northwestern University, where she also serves as Associate Dean for Academic Programs. Um, her first book, Stealing the Show, amazing book, African American Performers and Audiences in 1930s Hollywood, was published by UC Press, explores the complex relationships between black audiences and black performers in the classical Hollywood era. Stealing the Show has been awarded the Society for Cinema Media Studies Best First Book Award for 2016-2017. Um, 
She's an academic with a long-standing commitment to public scholarship and is also an avid producer of public programs. And she's currently at work on a book manuscript examining media mogul Tyler Perry. <laughs> Yasmina Price, there she is, is a writer, programmer, and PhD candidate in the departments of African American Studies and Film and Media Studies at Yale University. She focuses on anti-colonial cinema from the global south and the work of visual artists across the African continent and diaspora. All her series, In the Images, Behind the Camera, uh, Women's Political Cinema 1959 to 1992, played at BAM Cinema Tech in May 2022. Recent writings appeared in The Baffler, Art in America, Criterion's Current, and Film Quarterly. Last but never least, <laughs> Samantha Noel Shepard is an associate professor of cinema media studies in the Department of Performing and Media Arts at Cornell University. She received her PhD from UCLA, where she was one of the original members of the LA Rebellion Preservation Project of the UCLA Film and Television Archive. She is the author of Sporting Blackness, Race, Embodiment, and Critical Muscle Memory on Screen from University of California Press 2020, and co-editor of From Medea to Media Mogul, Theorizing Tyler Perry from 2016, and Sporting Realities, Critical Readings on the Sports Documentary from 2020. She has published essays in academic and popular venues such as Film Quarterly, The Atlantic, Flash Art International, and the Los Angeles Review of Books. And she's currently working on two new book projects. The first, The Basketball Film, A Cultural and Transmedia History, is under contract with Rutgers University Press. And the second, A Black Hole, Phantom Cinemas and the Reimagining of Black Women's Media Histories, is a project for which she was named a 2021 Academy Film Scholar from the Academy of Motion Picture Arts and Sciences. Hello. Okay, I am. Um, it's me transition. Someone didn't print her notes. Um, <laughs> all right. So um, you know, we want to talk about the, the intersections I talked about about scholarship, pedagogy, public engagement, of course. Um, but I really want to begin at kind of a basic question about how a gathering like this that we've experienced over the past several days. How does it inform our understanding of black women's filmmaking? What does it mean for the scholarship and the kind of writing that we do, we will do, and others might do? Anybody can start. Hmm. <laughs> <laughs> Thinking emoji. I could, I could start. Um, I mean, one of the things that I've been thinking about the last couple of days is how I came to know about the films that we've all been citing. And um, I watched them in the Film Studies Center in Cobb Hall, um, just a couple of blocks away. Um, I TA'd for Jacqueline Stewart's Redefining Black Film, black, uh, Redefining Black Cinema, re, in parentheses, as we did in the early 2000s. <laughs> Um, to, you know, that it's repetitive, it's constantly changing. And, um, you know, and she screened Losing Ground. One of my jobs was to um, monitor the screenings, and that's where I saw Losing Ground. And that's how I learned what's important. And that film, I mean, it was astonishing, but also normal to me. Um, everybody I knew was a black woman scholar. <laughs> so it just made sense, you know, and, um, and I learned how to treasure, you know, the types of works that we're celebrating today. Also, Elizabeth Alexander, um, you know, that's where I saw Camille Billups' work. Um, and just learn to think, I guess it's interdisciplinarily, but it's really like, I don't, well, I, it would just seem normal that you would go literature, um, film, sculpture, painting, um, you know, Professor Elizabeth used to say, you know, literature is the theory, poetry is the theory, um, and so, and the filmmaking is the theory. So I always thought of really drawing from, f 
from the work, but going back into it, it didn't need any explanation. It did not need me. <laughs> um, I was really more of a, a witness and, uh, um, and, a, and a chronicler of the work. I've never seen this group so quiet. <laughs> It, it's on. Um, I think one of the things it has me thinking about is the way that a lot of the same forces and pressures of erasure and contestation that we heard so many people talking about in the panels are imminent in our spaces as well. And I'm thinking about, so I think partially because of Shala's note on the last panel about uh, the violence of organized uh, forgetting, the Henri Giroux. And I was thinking about the, also the sort of ethic these days of cite black women. And I was, so I'm adding an emendation, which is cite black women media scholars, yeah. right? The ones you see on this stage are some of them, but if you don't know Triandria Russworm, if you don't know Krista Warner, if you don't know Beretta Smith Shomade, if you don't know Ellen Spears, if you don't know Kara Keeling, if you don't know Charlene Register, Karen Beaudry, Anna Everett, Bambi Hagens, Valerie Smith, Judith Weisenfeld, Shalene Green, Monica White and Dunu, um, when Raquel and myself and Beretta got together to write and in focus for the Cinema Journal, we started out by doing a roll call and we were thinking about the importance of the roll call to African American culture as a naming, as a saying of names and sometimes it's saying of names of people we've lost like Camille Billups or like Michelle Mater, but sometimes it's about saying the names of people that we know you ought to know. And so if you don't know those folks work, they're the people who are doing black film and media studies scholarship and you should because there's so many black women doing that work. Um, and so I just felt such kinship with that conversation all the way through because it's a, it's a kind of absence that doesn't have to be and shouldn't be. And you know, I think we make space for each other and we make space for ourselves by the work we do together. So, yeah, that's what I've been thinking about. And I would add that I think it's being here these past few days and the being able to witness and to listen and to learn and to <clears throat> experience a lot of individual and collective wisdom um, has been really beautiful because I think so, at least for myself, coming to a lot of these works came through reading about them um, and reading about figures. And so I think the role that um, the book Black Women Film and Video Artists played, and that's a collection that really privileges a conversation between um, critical scholars and media makers and distributors and, um, and exhibitors and all these questions around all of these issues. And so feeling like we share a space to to think through a, the legacy of, of, of the festival, but also the legacy of your careers. And then of course, an extreme amount of urgency, like walking out of here with so much urgency, like I must write, like I owe that basketball book, but I'm like, you're okay, right? Like <laughs> I've got to write this and I've got to do it now. It, it, you feel the pulse of, of this moment um, because that's also what, what gets taught. Like everybody keeps talking about Kathleen Collins because it's like you met her or you met her in the classroom or you taught the work or we teach the work, we teach the students, we're ma making films, but we are like directly trying to impart a change by showing, by reading, by writing. And it's really helpful when people write um, really good and accessible things um, that we are able to share with the students. Yeah, I would just say just to, to echo something Sam said, I think it's so important to understand that history is super active yeah. and erasure is active. And it's not just that like, oh, nobody knows this. It's nobody knows this because it's been obfuscated. Yeah. But I think the role that we can play is really pushing against those active erasures with active history making. Mm -hmm. 
I also think that some of this, I think sometimes silence also has to be respected. I think when you're making, it's hard to also be your own witness. Mm. And I think we have to have some grace for that also. That, um, that if, there, if we have the gift of an artifact or even a collection of artifacts mm -hmm. um, that give us you know, a portal, a path to the past, I think, I think we have, you know, I think we know how to embrace that. But I also think that sometimes, um, sometimes people, for various reasons, don't want to remember what they did or what they made or the process of making it. Um, or they, um, do you know, I mean, I, so I think it's some, there's some, there has to be space, I think, for honoring what people choose to make public and what they choose to remember. And that our witness is a collaboration with them. Um, you know, I think back to, um, you know, what Nina was talking about this morning with how we met and talking about her mother's work. Like, I hope I wasn't too aggressive about it hmm. because I was taking her to a place by bringing that up. And that a lot of the work that we're benefiting from, it's because of the kids who decide to keep their parents' legacy. Um, it's because of widows often. Um, it's former lovers. It's, it's really intimate work that I think we have to um, approach with some care and, and sometimes accept that there's this is a there's there's going to be a gap, um, and also the nature of the work. I don't even know if episodic quite captures it, but it's really get it done when you can get it done. You know, I mean, I we've all taught Black women's film classes, um, and what struck me was the first film. So it was like it was almost a syllabus entirely made up of first films, often thesis films, and. And I could feel in the students that they wanted that longer tradition. Um, but what I would say is like, well, the relay is yours now. Like it's, it's not always all there. And that, they're, that this is about understanding labor, it's about understanding the nature of making, and, um, and that we are working, all of us, in a, in a, in a, in a, in, among inequity, you know, it's so it's just not going to be fair or complete or entirely satisfying. But the witness, you know, is something we can offer. I think alongside what you were saying is that I think part of the importance of memory work and the labor of remembrance that it, it also makes it possible to have, um, to allow for the ephemeral in a way that means we won't forget things, which is to say that if there are the people who are doing the work of caretaking, the work of archiving, the work of remembrance, it also frees up the makers to work through experimentation and work through ephem ephemerality, <laughs> close. Um, you know, to have, to have an allowance to just make without worrying that if you are not also taking the time to stop and make sure that you're cataloging everything, someone is there doing it with you. And I think that's the beauty of um, this sort of, promiscuous, voluptuous gathering we have here, that it's a reminder that we each don't need to do everything. And I think that's something that will shape black women's labor, whether it's creative, whether it's manual, technical, what have you, is the sense that if, if we don't do it all right now, it'll get lost. But if there are enough of us, if we are working together, it means that you can tend to your garden here because I'm going to go get the hose. And you can spend as much time as you need looking at that begonia and you don't need to worry because I'm going to do my part. And that is the heart of collaborative work. It means that you're also allowed to do your little thing, not sure that you want to remember it, but someone else will be there as a witness with you. So I, I just wanted to say that, you know, first of all, this, this symposium has confirmed a lot of things that have been kind of important for my own growth as a scholar and, and someone who 
cares about teaching the idea of black film. Mm -hmm. uh, and that has everything to do with a particular devotion and appreciation for programming. Mm -hmm. um, I'm thinking a lot about, you know, when I first started grad school and, you know, the, I'd gone to a class, Daughters of the Dust was screened, got love for Daughters of the Dust, but also kind of curious about, well, what other work is out there? and not really having a lot of scholarship available. So just picking up the phone and calling up Third World Newsreel and calling up Women Make Movies and being like, tell you what, can I bring a sandwich and just hang out there all day? <laughs> and they just kind of put me in a room and I just watch films all day. And that kind of became a part of my early exposure to work. And also, you know, much love to Michelle Mater for her programming, uh, particularly um, the kind of revelation of her of the show that she did with Jake Perlin at Lincoln Center, the Tell It Like It Is, Black Independent Cinema in New York from 1968 to 1986. Um, and it's always been these kind of accumulative occasions to be available to be exposed and be open to uh, you know great programmers. Yeah, I'll follow up on that. Um, first of all, it's incredibly humbling to be on this stage uh, with both everyone who's been here uh, this this uh, today, and then this this group. It's um, yeah. Uh, uh, I started researching uh, the 1976 um, Sojourner Truth Festival of the Arts, um, and one of the first um, people I reached out to um, after the organizers um, was Michelle Matar. Um, and, and I wish that she were here um, today. And I think it's really, there are a couple of things that have really um, come up for me um, these last few days. Uh, one is that it's not just about what happens on the screen, that there is a whole bunch of other activities and practices that go into making a film culture. And so that can be programming, that can be archiving, that can be criticism, that can be just simply calling someone else up on the phone and talking at 10 p.m. Apparently these like 10 p.m. conversations <laughs> are really where things get done. Um, or late night texting in our yeah, case. Oh, um, not that that ever happened in the organization of this one. Um, <laughs> uh, and so, so I think, um, that's really important to remember and to study and understand that requires collaboration. And the rap on you know, academics is that we go up and we're in our little cubicles and we think big thoughts. Um, but that's not at all what happens. <laughs> and that, I think exclusively thought. small thoughts. <laughs> <laughs> See, we're warming up. Um, <laughs> um, <laughs> And, and that if, if filmmaking is a necessarily collaborative practice, so is um, film scholarship. And that's with everyone here on the stage um, and then all of you. Uh, and that's, I think, what is incredibly exciting and energizing about this whole event is the possibility for all of us to think together whether we are writing about films or making films or just loving films. Mm -hmm. right. not... Oh yeah, you haven't said anything yet. Okay, um, I just, I wanted to kind of piggyback off of something Haley said and then, and then also like pivot slightly. So I, I was just thinking about um, just all the people on the stage, like y'all were like 75% of my syllabus, you know, for my Black Film and Media class this semester. Um, but I was, I was thinking um, a bit about the energy of the past couple of days and how we translate that. Mm -hmm when the circumstances are quite different. And I'm thinking yeah. about basic things like, I'm like, I wanna show, I wanna screen that, how do I get that, right? And that's, and these are these things that we don't talk enough about, like the, the accessibility and, and, and the labor. I mean, I remember a number of years ago, I really wanted to teach um, Julie Dash's Illusions, but like I just hadn't got my life together to sort of get the film in enough time. And this is not like at a time when I could just like get it off of like Prime or Netflix or whatever like that, right? So it's like me putting out an SOS via text to Miriam and Miriam being like, girl, I'm gonna put in a Dropbox for you, but like that's how, that's how we're gonna do it, Sorry, right? Sorry, Julie. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> um, we don't do that. We don't do that. Um, and the reason, the reason I said that, 
Um, I was supposed to say my name. <laughs> <laughs> um, the reason the reason that I said like I didn't have my stuff together is because I would act, I mentioned that because I would never do that again because this is me as a very young junior professor who can only see I want to show this to my students and not thinking about if I don't go through the proper channels to actually get the distribution company to per, like to like for my school to purchase it then the filmmaker doesn't make any money off of it right and so having these types of conversations where you are sort of understanding the ways that all of the pieces like really fit together, I think is incredibly productive for us as, as professors um, who want to show the work to the students, but also want to sort of be about the politics that we claim to be about in the classroom. Yeah. One, of the, one of the reasons that the nine week screening series was part of the public calendar was so that the licensing and the rights were cleared for public exhibition not for classroom use. Mm -hmm. And so hopefully <laughs> folks got paid, um, even though we don't charge admission for these screenings, but the idea is to really marry that, the, all the sides of public exhibition, not just the audience, but what it means for the filmmakers to have their work shown publicly. Courtney. Um, I, I don't even know that I have anything to follow up on, because I really do feel like you brought up really important points, and I feel like Raquel and Ali, your pivot to um, I guess what 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 Fred Moten, um, black studies scholar, kind of indicates as kind of stealing from the university, right? Recruiting the kind of resources that we have available, um, the money that's not necessarily in our pockets, but in the library's pockets, to be able to uh, shuffle and, and direct that to to wonderful colleagues, to wonderful films, to inviting incredible filmmakers. Um, so I, I guess just in, in terms of responding to this initial question, one of the things that's, that I've been really thinking about and I've been really struck by is kind of this, this, the ways in which this black feminist or black women's filmmaking pro progress project um, articulates a version of what Solanus and Gattino talk about in third cinema, which is the film is the occasion mm. for the gathering, which yes. isn't to say that the film is bad or incidental or not important, but that the conversations, and, the, and also I'm also reminded, especially through all of you who've worked on the LA Rebellion, including the filmmakers who were part of it, how much filmmaking, more than literature, because I study literature too, and I, I also know shade to literature, but it is inherently communitarian yeah. and collective um, to get to the final project. I know that's not necessarily true for literature too, that you're not just writing in isolation. That's no more true than it is for us as scholars, but there's a way in which these, not just 10 p.m. texting, but these all-nighters in the editing room, mm -hmm. right, are, or, or, or just picking up and crewing for somebody's film, um, and also being in the audience, mm -hmm. whether it's a public audience or it's before your final cut, is, is so foundationally collaborative. And so there's this kind of weird divide between the scholarship, I think, that we've inherited in the particular in black women's filmmaking yeah. and the unauthorized, I'll say, scholarship that is already happening and theorizing that's already happening in this tradition of black women and black people's communitarian filmmaking progress. And I think so much of that is why oral history and archive collection, paper collection is so important. When you were saying that, Courtney, it reminded me that when we did the oral histories for the LA Rebellion, People may have remembered something about a film, but the stories were all about seeing the film with, other, with audiences. They were about the reaction, about the conversations about them, about the nights in the editing room. It was about the broader, you know, either exhibition context or the production context of the films, less than, oh, do you remember that amazing shot? <laughs> it was like, which is what film scholars tend to focus on, right? And so when we expand that out and make those kind of aspects accessible for everybody. I think that expands the scholarship too. I was going to ask you, do you think that that is a, like a particular contribution of black women's film theory, this theory of the gathering or, you know, that is, that is different from, um, I don't know, like 
a Scorsese class, or I, I don't know. Yeah, I don't know about no, I, the film. I don't know about the building, but, uh, but I, I've been palpably, and I know Evie Shockley was there, at, there was a Combahee River Collective yeah. um, symposium in like 2012 or something, oh, and it was yeah. very yeah. similar energy yeah. in the sense of also that we were just doing what we needed to do, and we were getting together and rapping about it and eating food and you know making really important things like a black feminist statement, but it was also just you're not alone. Mm. Well, and I think it's only in the context of the US that we have to sort of, you know, we have like this auteurship or the notion that Martin Scorsese was the only person who made his movie or whatever, right? Like black women, we have the humility to know that we don't do it alone, right? Whereas everybody else is like, it was my movie and I just like, <laughs> okay, sure, it was your movie, right? Like it, it takes everyone to do it. And I think there's an ethic of care and an ethic of integrity, and in, and an integ like I mean, when you think about how Alice Walker defines womanism as being something that's invested in black folks irregardless, and understands that the lifting of black women's lives and capabilities and capacities lifts everyone, right, because of the way that we sit. So, or like the when and where I enter. Mm -hmm. Right, so the collective is with it, with us, and within us. And so, you know, I mean, I say to my undergraduates every year, you know, you're not going to get through this place alone. Nobody gets through this place alone. Some of y'all are arrogant enough to think that you do, <laughs> but nobody does. And so, go ahead and ask for help because you'll get it sooner if you ask for it earlier. So, I just think the collective is a real part. And I think acknowledging it is part of our legacy and our history um, in a real way. I mean, I, I was just, in response to what you just sort of asked, Terry, I mean, I think it's also important to note that how a lot of us um, as professors sort of come into the space of the classroom is not necessarily the same as the way like that our white male colleagues, for instance, might come into the classroom. And so like, for me, I'm constantly trying to replicate a classroom experience that is how I grew up watching movies on 29th in Michigan with my parents. Um, like watching collectively with a family or aunts and uncles, whoever like had like the bootleg copy of whatever, like would bring it over. Like that's how you watch things. We would have debates on the playground about movies. And so for me, like critical analysis did not start in grad school. Critical analysis is, is if, you are, if you are black, you're already doing critical analysis, I think. Um, and so I also think that sometimes the, the, the shape that our scholarship tends to take is coming from, from that place. It, it's like the academy gives us sort of a, a language with which to articulate that and, and translate that to, to, to some folks, um, but it doesn't start there. And I think that's a key difference in our scholarship. When we co-edited um, or co-wrote the, the, the introduction with, with Beretta, I mean, there was, there was never a question that we, of course it's gonna be the three of us, right? I mean, we, we never thought well, we're going to figure out like the lead writer who's going to write the, it, like that was never an option, you know? Raquel, something I heard you say um, in a post-screening conversation with Michael after a screening of Garrett Bradley's Extraordinary American, she's I think very much the kind of filmmaker who would be a generation, I mean, a contemporary generation of what she you wanted to be here. She's in production. <laughs> Hi, Garrett. <laughs> that makes sense. Um, but you had brought up, you said, yes, the archive, but also the bootleg. And I think that was, I mean, you can tell me if I interpreted it wrong. That was no shade to archives, but it was also a reminder of the unauthorized, the non-institutional, those other forms of recording, um, which makes me think of Colleen Smith bringing up hearing that little T truth in Angela Davis's class, so also thinking of that little H history, but then also um, with Iman bringing up uh, Kathleen Collins's 1984 um, Howard lecture, one of the things she really speaks about is her refusal to be mythologized as a black person, and she says that she refuses to let anyone not let her be ordinary. And I think this is also a reminder of those kind of minor low frequencies, which are also the, the beating heart of what turns into a certain kind of critical black scholarship. And that's also coming out, I think, when people are going, mm-hmm, during the screening. I think that's also <laughs> that spiritual component. Those are also different forms of learning and where 
the, the scholar, the critic can come in is to, to put that in writing so we have somewhere to remember it, but it's not being produced in the writing in the same way that, I think, Rekha, what you were saying, a certain kind of critical thinking is not starting in grad school, it's starting in here, it's starting on the playground, it's starting in all these other places. Well, I would love for us to, I don't know if, I really enjoyed when um, when the filmmakers would talk about their early influences and sure. how they came to their practice. Like, I would, I mean, if it's not too intrusive. I mean, I would love to hear, like, how we each came to to film study. Um, I think that would, no, it's, it's interesting. Yeah, sure. Yeah. Do you want to start, or should we yeah, just go down? <laughs> Else You're gonna, that's private and ephemeral. I open this up. Yeah, I mean, you know, my dad was my first film programmer, actually. Uh, he, bringing home the, v, the VCR and the VHS from, um, not Blockbuster, there was another one, Red Something Video. No, it was before Red Box. Oh, this was, come on. Uh, I'll, be, I'll be, this Black is. Black don't crack. Yeah, this is like the late 80s or something. And Could be. This was no. This was in Florida. This was in Central Florida. Could have been Hollywood video. Um, but he. But he. And I remember watching um, Biko with um, Denzel Washington and this other person who I realized later was supposed to be the star of the film. Um, but in our house, like, Steve, like Denzel Washington and Biko were obviously the most important parts. And later I read something, I, I actually, I really can't remember his name, but I know that there was a white journalist who was telling Biko's story, and he was supposed to be the, the well-known and the more important character. But I never saw that, that never even occurred to me. And like I started wearing dashikis and being interested in what was going on in South Africa at the time and stuff. And so that was an early a kind of a film moment. And, but it was also in relation to going to fashion fair and um, cutting out patterns for my mom. Like it was all part of understanding creativity and making things, mm -hmm. you know. Um, I, I, I was thinking about this earlier today about when was the first time I ever heard of this wacky idea of a black woman filmmaker. Um, <laughs> And, and I realized it was probably about one o'clock in the morning in, in Spelman Gym in uh, the spring of 1989. Uh, there was this brother, Tommy Burns, that was showing my friend how to change film in a film bag. And he kept going on about the importance of the process. And then also, he kept talking about this film that he was getting ready to go shoot or go work on. And, um, and I kept, th and kept asking him more and more questions about this film. And uh, that film was Daughters of the Dust. And so, you know, particularly being in Atlanta at that moment in the late 80s, early 90s, I think what was really incredibly important for me in terms of becoming a black film scholar was the film programming at the National Black Arts Festival. Uh, I'm particularly thinking of a program in 1990 that included um, the film Chameleon Street, To Sleep With Anger, and there was a lot of talk about Julie Dash's Daughters of the Dust everywhere in, a, in Hotline at that time. Uh, so, you know, that's probably what kind of sent me down this road. Um, I also had a really incredible mentor, Dr. Linda Zatlin at Morehouse College. She's retiring this year after 55 years of teaching. Um, she taught me every, she taught me how to love literature. She also taught me that I should probably shouldn't go to grad school and study literature. <laughs> Uh, but we would always go to films together in Atlanta. So that is, uh, that's my joyful curse of why I do what I do. So I just went to the movies and I was a latchkey kid. So I was at the movies and watched a lot of television. And um, my journey to film is, I took a class, a black film class taught by Siri Nottage. Um, and it kind of opened my eyes, and I was a melon. I'm just a big old nerd, a stylish nerd, a well-dressed nerd, but, you know, a girl likes to read. <laughs> so 
which is why, I mean, there's, there's a longer story, and that's why we have dinner. But, like, the, I think I, <laughs> I, I want to say, I want to say something else, actually. Um, not that this isn't a great question, and I think it's a certainly an important question, what, you know, very Adrian Kennedy, the people who led to our place. But um, I, I also think it's really important to recognize, like, as all of us are up here, we are all interested in black women's media histories and futures, but like in completely different ways. Yes. Yeah, that's right. Like if you read my work and you read Miriam's work and you read Terry's and Raquel's, like it's so different. <laughs> um, and I think that's the thing that there's so many different approaches to historiography, to, to writing. I personally am interested in, you know, writing about gaps, but in a very different way that isn't just historical um, or chronological, um, but about the kinds of imaginative processes of filling those gaps. And I think that's also really important is that when somebody says they've got the definitive book on, you know, anything, or somebody is going to give you this version of history, I think it's really important to, to understand that we never, or I don't think we do, really think we're doing that. Um, we are giving one glimpse, one angle, one method, one theory, um, and moving that along. And so I think the range of scholarship here and the range of, range of approaches and also what we use as evidence or examples um, is, is so particular to our interests. And there's also no high-low like experimentation and is valued and the popular is valued, the unseen, the hidden movie, um, the, the never before seen film, um, all of the, the work that was not done. Um, <laughs> shout out to Leslie Harris um, who wrote on her film, I Love Cinema, which never got made. It's just a Kickstarter campaign. And I would be remiss if my son's watching, happy birthday Bayard yeah. on the streaming. Yeah. You're seven years old, look at you, thank you. <laughs> you know, <laughs> I, I hadn't thought about this till you asked that question, Terry. Like, I think about it occasionally, but I think the reason that I'm sitting up here with you, um, other than I put myself as the moderator, <laughs> like, cosmically, um, is because when I was in my first year of grad school, um, thinking I was going to do, I was interested in political art and filmmaking, I was going to do, I don't know, European something or other. I went to the Harvard Film Archive because they were showing this film, Sankofa. And I sat in that theater and I thought, no, I'm doing this. That, that was basically it. I, I love this idea of like an origin story. Uh, <laughs> yeah. it's a villain. A, a villain. All superheroes it's, have you know, it's, it's, it's funny because <laughs> I feel like we, like as scholars, you write about stuff, you write about stuff, and it's only like later where you start to like yeah. piece things together. And, like Michael's always like joking with me about like, he's like, your Catholicism is showing in that piece. And then I was sitting here and I was like, oh, this is a thing. Like this whole like, the spectacle of being, you know, growing up in the Catholic church, perhaps that, you know, was, had more of an influence than I realized. Um, yeah, I mean, for, for, for me, I, I already said this, but, um, you know, like I, I grew up on 29th in Michigan, um, it's kind of like down the street, and my mom worked days my dad worked nights. The three of us, I'm an only child, we were never, the three of us were never really like in the house together, honestly, um, except on Saturdays, um, because that's the day my dad had off. And that's the day that we would watch movies together. Um, and I, yeah, I didn't like kind of put that together until like two years ago. Um, but maybe that's why I'm, I'm interested in this. Um, for me, there was always like a discussion, and I don't mean like, like my parents were not professors, but I mean there was always a discussion about representation and my mom would be like, oh, like, Gone with the Wind, look at Head McDaniel, like, isn't that a shame, the stereotypes, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And my dad would be like, yeah, but like, look at her performance in that movie, because, you know, and there was always this kind of back and forth in this conversation. Um, and I was always, I took kind of a twisted, windy path to get to um, grad school, but there's a shock when you get to grad school and you're like, I'm gonna do, you know, yay, we're gonna talk about black film, and suddenly, the bad objects were all the things that my family like loved and bonded over. Um, and I realized as I get older, not that I, I'm not critical of those things because I am, but I realized that I'm actually perhaps more than being interested in film, I'm really interested in how black people watch films and how the, the, what films mean to us. I still have like stacks of VHS tapes of like my favorite television shows that my dad would record like off the television when I was away at college and he would like 
press stop to edit out the commercials and then press record again, and he mm -hmm. would box them up and send them to me. And like, mm -hmm. you know, we, we're not like a huggy family, but like I would get those, right? Um, and I think that there's something about how I try to show up sort of in academia, which is, which is honoring that, replicating that, and trying to create that honestly for, for my students in my classroom and hopefully for the, the people who, who read uh, what I write. I think there are three beats for me about this uh, origin story thing. I think the earliest one that comes to mind where I knew maybe representation was a problem for us, right? Um, I have an aunt who was um, a PhD in drama and she taught at University of Wisconsin-Madison for many years in the Department of Drama. She was the Tennessee Williams Scholar. Her name was Esther Merle Jackson. Um, and when I met Esther Jackson, who did the Freedom Ways um, magazine, she told me how they often would have people coming and looking for the other person in their office, like, you know, I'm not that Esther Jackson, I'm the <laughs> other Esther Jackson. But um, she, she um, had a PhD from the Ohio University. She taught at Hampton for many years. Just very much an HBCU product of her time. Twin sets, pearls, mm. pumps, she always smelled like Listerine, kind of. She, she, <laughs> she's like, she was very just respectability all the way around and twice on Sundays, right? And just every once in a while when she'd come and visit us, she and my mom would sit down in the basement together and sort of maybe get a little drunk because she was teaching at a predominantly white institution where people were not always, and maybe most of the time, not happy to see her. But she was brilliant and just one of the most upright people I had ever seen. And she was my Aunt Esther, and it was the 1970s. And the only Aunt Esther in representation in the 1970s was on Sanford and Son. And that Aunt Esther bore no resemblance whatsoever to my amazing, brilliant scholar, professor, Aunt Esther. And when I would say to my friends at school, my Aunt Esther was, they'd all just crack up laughing. And I'd be like, you don't understand who I'm talking about. Like there was this way that I was like, okay, so there's something that's erasing my aunt. I, I, it really bothered me. It really, really, really bothered me. And I remember that really staying with me um, as a problem, right? As a problem that her humanity was just being completely eclipsed in this way. Um, I think that was one beat. I think the second one was in high school in my French class where we had just seen Les Pères Prix de Cherbourg, which I loved, but I was also like, it's very white, but I did love it. Like, <laughs> all those songs are so catchy. Like, you know, they just stuck with me. And it's beautifully filmed and the colors, you know, all of that. But then the next week we watched uh, Rue de Casnegre. Mm. We watched Yusanne Palsy's uh, Sugarcane Alley. And then I was like, oh, well, okay, right? Like, that was so different. And that little boy was just so beautiful. And that story was so not one that I had seen. And I thought, okay, that's something. And I think probably the third is like, it's like my eldest sister who uh, taught me how to be a feminist sort of organized, uh, not organized, uh, we had these command 3 a.m. movies that we would watch. And Jill was an amazing film curator. And so I saw The Times of Harvey Milk at 3 a.m. You know, I saw Animal Farm at 3 a.m. Right, like these kind of 3 a.m. movies that, like, I mean, we're obviously nerds, right? We've, we've established that as a clear fact, but... A little bit. A little bit, yeah, yeah. But there was something about these problems and possibilities, these problems, these possibilities, these problems, these possibilities, that just stuck in my head. And I think, you know, kind of led me to my fate. <laughs> Thank you for having like some kind of moment. Um, 
reassessing like my entire life. <laughs> and um, <laughs> so um, with, <laughs> I feel like I'm about to launch into, what, what is it, Steve Martin's like, when I was a blind black child. <laughs> but um, <laughs> no, when I was. <laughs> So, as, as with many folks here, I uh, grew up in the post-civil rights movement, and I also grew up um, with lovely parents who are probably not watching, I love you, um, <laughs> who kind of subscribe to the, we need to get out of the city. My dad was from Southern Virginia, not far from Danville. My um, mom was from Harlem and they moved to the Jersey freaking shore, which my mom would mock me for. She'd be like, I'm from New York, new from New Jersey. And I'm like, you did that to me. Um, <laughs> which is the, all to say I was the only white kid apart from my brother and the principal's adopted black kid in my grade school, K through, uh, K through ninth grade. And this was like the, the multiculturalism, colorblindness moment. Um, so, there was, I feel like there were a lot of really fraught images of blackness. I mean, there were, clearly there's been a huge history of really fraught images of blackness, in particular black women. Um, but I feel like there was also this silencing of a conversation, at least in my, in my space, about like, things are really just generally going to get better because this is what we were promised by the civil rights movement. Um, so I didn't necessarily grow up with the explicit tools to understand why these, Im these horrible images um, or these very narrow images were happening or there was no image at all. I do also know, and this kind of comes to the gaps and to what Raquel, you were saying too about black film culture. Um, my, when we first got cable, my grandmother, me coming home, my grandmother saying, you're gonna watch this and she just sat me down <laughs> and I watched My Fair Lady and like there's, Theoretically, nothing she should have seen of herself in My Fair Lady, except that she is incredibly glamorous, like extraordinarily glamorous. Later, she said, oh, you know, I went to like acting school for a minute with Ruby Dee. I'm like, what are you talking about, right? And she's Harlem. Uh, she saw, I saw one of the Nicholas brothers on the bus. Like there was just something in the air. Um, I remember watching a soldier's story with my family, The Five Heartbeats. It was just part of the vibe, and I had a feeling that I had a lot of times during this conference, which is stay quiet, grown black folks are talking. <laughs> and um, you're gonna learn something, do not interrupt these people, they're about to spill some serious tea. Um, and just to not give you my whole Steve Martin-esque narrative, um, so I feel like I was searching for images without necessarily knowing that I was searching for them. I think, yes, it was, Daughters of the Dust, when I got to college, took a film class with Trin Min Ha um, with a lot of British films. So I looked to Britain for blackness in a certain sense because of how dominant Hollywood was in controlling the, the cinematic landscape that I encountered. Um, and then I, I studied with Lorraine O'Grady and he said, you have to watch Daughters of the Dust. And I'm also aware of non-theatrical film, but art film. So I'm thinking Adrian Piper's Cornered. Um, and I eventually brought my grandmother, the one who made me watch uh, My Fair Lady, and she just looked at this exhibition and at that piece and said, I didn't realize we could say that, um, which I thought was so deep because I know she said exactly that kind of thing to her boss when she got looked over, passed over for a promotion. Um, so, yeah, that, so, so just to kind of return to the, 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 the uncanniness of the present, that first night of screenings, I was looking at these, those amazing films and thinking, these look so familiar, I don't quite remember them. And I realized that the aesthetic somehow was what I wanted, that it kind of occupied this kind of fever dream, this idea, this hope that I had. And I didn't know it existed, but on some level I think I knew that it could have, and so I'm, I guess I'm just saying really, really grateful to the filmmakers for making that work, committing it to film. Even if I didn't see it in the moment, 
it, you're, you're, you're kind of filling in the gaps of my own, I mean, this is something that came up last panel, filling in the gaps of my own, if not cinematic reality, cinematic desires for black womanhood, so. Can I, can I follow up on that unless someone wants a origin story? Uh, go ahead, Tara. Yeah, no, you just made me remember how, um, how, you know, I came to the US as a nine-year-old from Jamaica, so like my idea of the world was formed and then I came here and became like a black girl. Um, and sorry, and you're welcome. <laughs> yeah, sorry, and you're welcome. It was a, a joyful curse, a, or a cursing joy, I don't know. But it was, but there's something about the films that I like and that I write about that, are, that immerse or return me to something that I remember about being a kid in Kingston or being around my grandparents and their friends. Um, like when a frame is filled with, um, with black faces, you know, um, or people are just hanging out or just, you know, uh, like, I don't know, Killer Sheep or even Sam Ben's on Noir, like at the end, the, where, the, where they, when we go back to the village and there are these beautiful portraits of the, the boys that are hanging out around um, Ecole Populaire and uh, just, uh, you know, Kevin Jerome Everson's films. Um, the home movies uh, from you know the Florida Moving Image Archive, all of these kind of um, very personal, everyday-ish, um, just very black, very black films. It doesn't matter what their accents are. I think it's really speaking to maybe eight-year-old Terry before the plane ride up here. She was gonna ask something else, but no, I'm gonna ask <laughs> different something. Um, I'm curious about a couple things, and maybe I'll ask them both in this way. One is to follow up on something Courtney said um, to remind us that the symposium followed a nine-week screening series. And what if, if you know some of those films and, and some of the films that we've talked about in the last couple days, maybe from Thursday night even, you know, is there one film from the series that you want audiences to know about that you thought that exists, people need to know about that. Um, and also, I think, thinking about what you see as some of the legacies of the work of those filmmakers, the kind of cross-generational echoes, and maybe one way of answering that is in 10 years, <laughs> what will we have said, do you think? What do you think the scholarship will hopefully look like in terms of the critical assessment, if we can project into the future, of where we're at now? Totally unfair question. That's okay. <laughs> That's horrible. Should we make a plug? This is a good time for a plug, ain't it? It feels like a moment, Miriam. It's a good let's, time let's for a plug. It. Let's do this. So one thing that will be in the scholarship 10 years from now is a special issue of feminist media histories mm -hmm. devoted to the films of Camille Billups and James V. Hatch that mm -hmm. Terry and I are co Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, which and the part of our motivation is that we noticed that there's a long gap between the 90s when um, Camille Billups was you know won her award at uh, Sundance and she's screening at TIFF and um, and really internationally and there's scholarship to go along with it and then there's a then there's a, a lull like a long lull since, um, since maybe the late 90s, Bell Hooks mm -hmm. interviewed her and wrote about her. And so our project is to revisit, reanimate, um, and see what we, what we can see now. Yeah. I don't know, how do, we put, how do we put it in the call? Well, I, I mean, yeah, no, that's exactly right. I mean, I think it's partially, what I always super appreciate about that body of work and um, Camille's approach in particular, if you knew Camille for like more than like five years, you were gonna be on her S list at some point. Like she was not the easiest person in the world. Uh, she knew this about herself and she could be really difficult. She really, really could. Um, and at the same time, I think the place that that is really beautifully a part of her film work is the way that she's less invested in a pretty picture than she is in hard truth, real talk, 
digging deep, right? And so for me, whenever I teach a film like Finding Krista, I want to teach it with Suzanne Suzanne because on the one hand, you have this story that she tells about her decision to give up her child for adoption when the child was four years old, which is a just wrenching story that she was brave enough to share. Mm -hmm. And then on the other hand, when you see a film like Suzanne Suzanne, you realize that beneath this beautiful home movie picture of her, you know, Suzanne's family and everybody is you know, beautiful and well shot and the mountains are in the background. And beneath that pretty picture is abuse. Mm -hmm. Beneath that pretty picture is sexual and physical abuse and a father who terrorized a family for years, right? So you have a pretty picture. You could just stay with the home movies if you want to. But so, you know, you can imagine uh, Camille as a monster for giving up her child for adoption and decide that that's the ugliest picture that's possible, or you can look at this sort of pretty facade of a middle-class family and be invested in that, right? So I just think that kind of unapologetic and really hard-hitting truth-telling is part of what's hard for us because we love a pretty picture and we need one sometimes. Sometimes we really, really need one. But are we willing to sacrifice everything for one is the question that I think her work often asks us. And Ali, I think it's a hard question to ask us to spotlight one piece um, because they're all, I think what your course demonstrates is how um, vital each one of those films are, um, just right. like this entire series. Um, so I, I will not answer that question, and <laughs> um, I will be shameless it, over but here. But I will, <laughs> but I will say it's always a great honor to to recognize films that make a really big impact. And one of the films that was screened during the series that definitely has always made a big impact in how I've thought about life and the world is Zanabu Irene Davis's Cycles, yes, which has yeah. given the greatest motto, which is progress is being made. <laughs> you are doing okay, and it's going to get better. <laughs> so I kind of live my life by that motto. Um, and I hope in 10 years we have, we have the scholarship from those on this stage. Right. The, um, and, I, and I also want to underscore this. I think it was said earlier. There's something very beautiful as a scholar to watch someone as amazing as Michelle Wallace be on stage and say to Haley O'Malley, your work reminded me of something. I'm trying to remember through your work. Right. So I look forward to your book, which um, is um, gonna fill, I wouldn't say fill, like, it, it's, going to, it's going to take its place. And it's gonna remind people of a lot of places. I look forward to Gates's book. I look forward to my book. You know, um, I look forward to the work that is that is that is that is coming out. But I just this is this is a celebration of you all, but it is also a celebration of scholarship. So thank you. Thank you. One of my origin stories with becoming a film scholar is my professor said, well, who are your models? And who do you want? Who, who are you in conversation with? And I took that quite literally. And so um, <laughs> <laughs> would then um, invite people to be on panels. <laughs> And so being in conversation with Dr. Shepard, with Dr. Field, with Dr. France, everyone on this has, is, has been um, why I'm doing the things I do. Uh, I'm gonna follow up and uh, answer, answer Ali's question by not answering Ali's question. Um, <laughs> with two things. Um, one, uh, the, the series as a whole, the idea of having a nine-week screening series that is open to the public, this is not something that we came up with ourselves. And so this has been done many times, and it's been done by the filmmakers who are part of this series and the filmmakers who um, 
you know, uh, some of whom cannot be here. And so let me just give you two examples. Um, one is Tony K. Bambara. And so when she was teaching at um, Spelman College in 1977, um, she was teaching a, a she was, was a writer in residence, and, um, but she didn't just want to teach literature. Um, so she wanted to teach literature and film. And uh, so super successful class, um, fall semester, and then some sort of administration error um, meant that no one enrolled for like part two. And so she's like, hmm, well, let me do a film series instead. <laughs> and uh, the president said, no, we kind of hired you to teach. <laughs> she's like, fine. Uh, so she ends up, um, producing this uh, program that is a class as well as a public screening program. Uh, and she put advertisements in the newspapers saying, invite um, friends on campus and off. And I think that is what we were trying to do uh, with this whole series. Um, one other thing on the Camille Billups deal, um, Camille Billups was a filmmaker. She was also an archivist, a programmer, kind of an extraordinaire. She was part of the original 1976 festival. And uh, she was lecturing in art history before she turned to film, as Monica Freeman said. And the reason that I started researching um, the 1976 festival is because I was in her archive in Emory, and she had oral, you know, a series of oral histories. And one of those oral histories was Kathy Sandler interviewing Monica Freeman. Mm -hmm. And Kathy Sandler just so happened, because she knows this history, to ask Monica about this amazing film festivals that she curated. And so hearing that then went and made me want to look for more. Um, and I couldn't have done that without all of you. Um, and all of you, and so, thanks. <laughs> Amazing. Uh, can I, just picking up on the Bambara thing and also making a plug, uh, Tony, uh, so I'm, um, Haley is contributing to it. I am co-editing with Liz Reich and Ellen Scott for Film Criticism Journal, which is an online journal, which means it's gonna be, I think, accessible to everyone, a volume on uh, black film feminisms. Liz Reich has already hosted an incredible round table with film black women filmmakers, Tracy Strain and so many others. Um, that's gonna be transcribed. Charlene Register has contributed. Um, we're working on reprints. And so hopefully that will also, that, well, it better be out in, in 10 years. But, um, <laughs> but also I just wanted to say like in terms of the work and thinking about what it is we're doing, the kind of curation, right? That it doesn't just mean choosing, it means caring for. Um, and I, I remind my students of that. And I'm also thinking about what I think is a really wonderful and foundational black feminist film critical essay that inspired me to, to edit, the, to co-edit that journal issue, which is Deep Sight and Rescue Missions, where she makes that call for cultivating the deep sight Right? and the language and cultivating a rigor to be able to recognize and to talk about what is happening in black women's filmmaking. And that part of that is also paired with a rescue mission, right? To also make sure that those films don't die because as the saying go, it lives as long as it's, it's, it, rem it remains spoken and in someone's mouth. Um, yeah. I wanted to, Ali asked where do we, what was like, where do we see this in 10 years? So I've like, since we started, I've already been like planning my syllabi for like next semester, cause that's just sort of where my head is. And you know, one of the things that I know about everybody in this panel, like we all teach either like a black film and media course, a black women's film course, something like that. And I was already getting like my mind around that for, for next year. But the problem, at least within a lot of our institutions, those are always electives. Those are always the, the courses that the students can opt into and usually like when they've done all the required courses. So they've had two years of, of, of looking at film as, you know, whatever, um, not taught by us necessarily. And so I started thinking about, 
I need to put all of these in my intro class. Like, I, this is, okay, so the unit on, like, mise-en-scene, I'm gonna pull from here, right? But, like, and it, it occurs to me that in, in what I would hope is that in 10 years, the intro to film class is like those first courses that future filmmakers and critics take that their vision of what film is, is, is this. And with additional apologies to Miss Dash, that is why I have a copy of Illusions. <laughs> Because I use it to teach sound. Yeah. The week that we teach sound, that's what I use because the I way use it to that- to mess them up with singing so in the I rain. hope you have the restored version with the corrected sound. <laughs> and I will send the royalties to you soon. <laughs> um, so and I, I'm gonna try and speak to your question by pivoting from your question. Okay, so- Good acting. Yeah, so in 10 years, I would hope that people would revisit what is work which will probably be crucial and foundational to how we go about thinking about a, a history of black women filmmaking. Um, I was thinking of Tony Cape and Barr's essay collection for sure, but I'm, I'm, I'm definitely thinking of uh, Jacqueline Bobo's Black Women Vi Film and Video Artists, which was uh, an incredible anthology in terms of the work that it drew, that um, uh, the, the work that was collected within it, but that the book ends with a model of a syllabus, mm -hmm. That's right, yeah. right? And that it also, quite importantly, you know, we've all read these kind of Sermon from the Mount uh, black film histories, which are kind of um, so definitive and so deadening that one can't even uh, conceive of a possibility of some kind of deviations. But when you read that intro to black, film, uh, black women film and video artists, there's, it, it's, it's just so um, incredibly purposeful in, in, in the capacity of possibilities, you know, that, that in the sense that it can so easily speak to what can possibly develop within the next 10 years. And that has a lot to do, I think, with what's really incredible about a lot of the scholarship that everyone on this stage does to some extent of that we're actually trying to do a type of work which contributes to the continued animacy of the idea of black film. We're not performing autopsies in the sense that you study something and end up killing it in the process, right? We want this to live on and so that our writing might contribute to things that we can't even imagine in this moment. And that's part of what's cool about the field is that it is always changing and opening up. It's very contingent. I mean, how many times just in the last six months did we have to revise our idea of the first because of oh, Ali's wow. work and Kara's work, Kara Kadu. I mean, it's um, so that you always have to be mindful of the of first being um, the idea of the current notion of first <laughs> that is indicating a kind of beginning that is about to be redefined uh, in ways we can't yet think about. There's a contingency there. And then a lot of the things that are like, you know, I don't know, found is also a complicated word, but that returns to our collective imaginary, let's say, is we didn't know it was missing. Mm -hmm. You know, we didn't know what was they, what, what we don't have. And then it comes back and then things start to look a little bit different next to it. And that's part of the fun of it, the possibilities that Michael's talking about. Absolutely. And I do think, you know, once we get a night's sleep, we will, <laughs> Haley and I will talk about what we can do uh, publication wise that will gather this in some kind of written form um, for the future. So I think that's really important, just like the LA Rebellion book with collection of oral histories and um, filmographies and stuff. I mean, even having that documentation is valuable. Um, I did want to, I, I can't imagine folks want to talk to us, but maybe you do. So if you have questions, oh, oh, my, oh, oh, wow. Okay, like it's like you want to, you want to hear from us? Oh. Yeah, Haley, do you want to actually, I, I think Doug's running up with a phone, uh, with a, do you, yeah, we're popular. Haley, can you, is that Io? I can't see. Yeah, give Io the mic and then, here he comes. I, that was a surprise. I, go ahead. Unexpected. So I, I'd like to thank uh, each of you for your scholarship. I feel like I had to wait for you to be born. Um, so much of the early writings around black cinema were through um, a literary lens. 
and sort of a disregard or not knowing uh, of film as um, visual rhetoric. So I'm very appreciative of your work. The question that I have, I am on the advisory board of a newly formed group called Missing Movies. And the goal is to bring back into circulation films that we love, that don't have distribution, that are hard to find. Mm -hmm. And so I'm wondering if any of you have um, movies that you um, think should be on this list that are hard to find, not in distribution, but you know something that you love. Mm. I'm on the board too, mostly. So am I. I work with, yeah, so Sam. <laughs> <laughs> because shout Shala, out to Missing Movies. Yeah, shout out to Missing Movies. Shala is, Dennis and Amy, Maya. Um, we care very much, I think, about, about the archive and also what's not in the archive. And a lot of our work, one of the questions I was going to ask about what do you do with fragmentation or missing material, a lot of us work on these kind of what Sam calls phantom cinemas. Um, so uh, I, I think the particular titles or particular pieces, I mean, there's so much. Well, while you think about that, I'll say that we've been working on a list uh, yeah. with, with yes. archives, and we That's developed true. that list uh, in part starting from Tony K. Bambara's filmography that ends with a roll call, yeah. and so you we know, we're going, going on that. <laughs> We have a massive list that we want to share, and we want you to add to it, and we want to think about that list together. And <laughs> so. what we curated in nine weeks was the tip of the iceberg. I mean, I should say that, too. This wasn't scrounging for material. This was about selecting what could fit into a screening series. So we have so much work, and we're looking for so much more work. Um, I think Michelle Parkinson's Sojourner is probably the film that I, I wish we could include because of obvious reasons, but. Um, but we do have a production photo, so make sure you come to our Saturday night slideshow <laughs> tonight at dinner. <laughs> I'm glad you asked that question. I don't know. Uh, up there, yep. Hi. Hi, um, my name is Liz. I'm from <laughs> um, Johannesburg, South Africa, and I'm currently based in Palo Alto and Bay Area. Um, and I want to open up with gratitude, like extreme gratitude to all of you filmmakers, scholars, everyone. Um, you have no idea how much I've gained from you. And if anything, I can be living proof of just like how global and international your reach is um, and how important that is to people in the black diaspora outside of the US um, and people on the continent. Um, and the reason I've stayed in the US for as long as I've stayed and plan to stay for the foreseeable future is this like deep connection between South Africa's history and the US and similar, similar things. Um, and then we see those same things being reflected in art and in film. Um, and so for me, it's always been sort of a both and approach and understanding of um, folks from the continent and their histories and work in film and art and learning so much Im important um, and seminal sort of knowledge and writing from African-American scholars and filmmakers and African-American women scholars and filmmakers. Um, so I'm not an either or sort of thing, um, but I'm always interested in kind of the echoing back between the continent and um, other countries um, where there's large populations of people from the diaspora. And so I'm kind of just, my question is, if any of you could speak to um, any of your engagements in recent years, in the past, um, with scholars or filmmakers from the continent or any personal experiences, um, sort of um, with any, any of the countries on the continent and how that either sort of impacted or didn't impact your your scholarship, your research, or just you as, as humans, um, and any thoughts on that for sort of the future, if you're curious about those, those engagements, or... Uh. <laughs> uh, thank you for that question. Um, so I'm from Niger, so West Africa, the part that was colonized by France, and I've now been here for 12 years, but I came to black cinema 
from a perspective where I, I had to learn that blackness needed to be named because obviously on the continent, you know, your, your ethnicity, your, your colonially imposed nationality, but blackness doesn't quite operate in the same way. But um, for example, one of the things I found so beautiful in the first night of programs on black women's interior lives was the first thing I thought of after watching all of those films in sequence. And I've been so, um, uh, I mean, it's, it's the loss still feels so fresh, but um, I've been so glad to hear Safi Fine named first by Zainab Arin Davis and then several times again, um, because her first film uh, was uh, La Passante or The Passerby, which came out in 1972. And in that film, uh, you, can, you can see her working through exactly what those black American women filmmakers were working through, which is how am I being looked at? Because she's literally walking around Paris and she's working through the way black men and white men are looking at her and she's looking back. And so she's taking an autonomous, empowered stance to project that look back and also to challenge it and to propose a kind of oppositional reading. So Ali, when you pose that question of what are the things that could happen in 10 years is I hope that we will only have a proliferation of black women's, black queer, black gender non-conforming filmmakers and visual cultural workers, et cetera, in an expansive lens, because I think what was much more alive in the 60s and 70s was the spirit of Pan-Africanism, was a real sense of black internationalism as something that was alive and that was summoning all of us. Um, and, you know, one of the things that I hope um, scholarship, writing, criticism can do is facilitate certain encounters that just aren't possible inside the films themselves, because you can't play three films at the same time, but you can talk about three films together. So for example, um, my dissertation, three of the core people are Sarah Gomez, Sarah Maldoror, and Safi Fai. So three black African continental diasporic women who are frequently spoken about as individuals and in isolation, and that happens with black women artists in general. Always isolated, we always fixate on the pioneer, the first, the alone, when we know that it never happens alone, but w where we can intervene with the writing, with the scholarship, but also with the programming and with the teaching is to put all of that in conversation because, you know, yes, Safi Fai and Sara Gomez were not working together, but they were challenging the entire Euro white supremacist colonial world order. And this is what all of these women filmmakers are doing. And I think that that um, that is not a new conversation, it's an ongoing one, but I think the fact that you asked that question is a sign yeah. that it's on all of our minds and in all of our spirits more and more, which I think is incredibly encouraging in terms of the possibility of having um, a form of, of critical engagement with black women's filmmaking that is not in comparison to white women's filmmaking, that is not in comparison to, to anything other than the pluralities and multiplicities that already exist within us and that kind of non-mythologized, non-monolithic, we're everything. Yeah. Yeah. I'm glad you asked that question too. I think for myself, I may tend to fixate too much on African cinema that gestures toward diaspora. I'm thinking about Usman Semben's Pièce d'identité. Uh, I'm thinking about Mati Diop's uh, Atlantique. Um, and there's a way that, and I'm also thinking about like the staging of the rupture and wound of diaspora in Black Panther, right? Like, I, I, I and I think, you know, so I want to make sure that I don't overemphasize, all right. <laughs> They go rogue sometimes, you know, they just, they be jumping off. They want some space for themselves, child. So, I mean, but I think that, they, no, you, are you kidding? You gotta help a sister out. I think there's a way that my own uh, um, preoccupation with those kinds of t texts that tread that ground has to do with the way that that's a conversation that I wish we can have. Right, that I think is a really important conversation to have about the way that black folks across the diaspora get mediated out of each other's lives. 
get and and there's a way that we're mediated out of understanding our relationship to one another. And so for me, that's a really interesting and generative thing to think about. I, I don't want to do it to the exclusion of films that are like someone in Senegal is eating a sandwich and it's delicious, right? Like the mundanity is also a really beautiful thing to be able to engage. But I, I will say for myself that those are the kinds of texts that give me grist from my mills and something that I like to think about. I'm being told our time is up. What? And not by me, I know. I'm not, I'm not the bad guy. <laughs> I want to thank this panel so much, my friends, my colleagues, my inspirations. Thank you, guys.